Uh, yeah, I, I think I love this game. Elden Ring is a masterpiece. There's just no other word for it. Even a 10 out of 10 doesn't feel like it does this game justice. As someone who is incredibly excited leading up to its release, this game has somehow surpassed all of my expectations. I have not been this thoroughly engrossed in a game in years. Not only are the environments jaw-droppingly beautiful, not only does it have some of the best combat and level design from software has ever created, it also packages all of that in an impossibly large world. I'm sitting here with over 60 hours in the game, and the end is still not in sight. If I had to guess, I'm probably at least 75%, maybe 80% of the way through. However, you never know with FromSoft. Also, keep in mind, I personally have a lot of experience with the genre, and if you're familiar with me at all, you'll know that I'm pretty good at these games. I'm saying that not to brag, but to say that those 60 hours are very likely closer to at least 80 for the average player, and I wouldn't be surprised if it took some people over 100 hours to do everything in this game. And that's not even touching the online stuff, which will increase that number significantly. So let's talk about it. Why is Elden Ring good? Why does it work? And quick note before we get into anything, this video will only contain footage from the first two regions of the game, and I'll do my best to not spoil anything major. If you've seen footage from the network tests and a couple trailers here and there, you should probably be fine watching this video. I really do want everyone to experience the sheer joy and wonder of the big and small surprises in this game, and I know how special the first playthrough of a FromSoft title can be. I won't be going into any great detail for the topics in this video, so consider this just the broad strokes of what to expect and why I like this game so much. First off, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. This is a Souls game. It 100% has all of Dark Souls DNA, but cranked up to 11 and placed in a truly open world. And if you're somehow watching this video without knowing what the Souls series is, they're the series of games by developer From Software and quite simply some of the best action RPGs ever. And Elden Ring has somehow surpassed them. It's simply the best. The only reason you wouldn't want to play this is that you can't unplay it and attempting to go back to other games that attempt similar things will be difficult. Even if you've somehow bounced off of earlier FromSoft games in the past, I'd strongly, strongly encourage you to still give this one a shot, and I'll talk more about that later. For now, let's move on and talk about the world, map, and structure of Elden Ring. The environments of this world are consistently some of the most beautiful and stunning that I've seen in gaming as a whole. From the way the light pokes through trees as you're riding your horse, to how fog rolls across hills, the overworld is a treat to simply take in. The topography is also pretty crazy with how much this game plays with elevation, and from a purely artistic angle, I don't think I've seen a game top this. And that beauty isn't limited to just landscapes. You can explore caves heavy with atmosphere that are pitch black dark without a light source, or maybe it'll start raining while you're on the walls of a castle. It's so good. Also, I'm not usually a big graphics guy, but the shadows and the lighting and the reflections, it's just astounding to me how good it all looks. And it just gets better the more you play. There were moments where I legitimately had to set my controller down just to stare at my screen because of how awestruck I was. I won't show these to you because I want you to experience them for yourself, but wow. FromSoft has created some of the coolest looking areas I've seen in any game ever. And all of this is somehow contained within an absolutely massive map. I was expecting something less than half this size. If there's one thing I can guarantee that literally every reviewer will say, it's that this game is big. But anyone can make a big world. It feels like that's pretty common these days. But what's not common is just how dense this world is with things to discover and do. FromSoft has proven for years that they're the best in the business when it comes to designing levels, and they've extended that expertise into not only the interior dungeons, but to the world itself. There is so much to find, and I kept catching myself thinking something like, surely they wouldn't put something here. Surely this is just empty space. But time and time again, I was rewarded for my curiosity when exploring. Bro, what? How is there a cave here? How is there a cave here? It's a fucking big cave! Even beyond finding mark locations on the map, there's little things added to fill the gaps, like wandering enemies, carriages pulled by giants, bosses, and even giant bears. And side note, the pure panic of getting chased by a bear the size of an elephant that can knock down trees is really something that I think everyone should experience. And side note for that side note, destructible environments really make these encounters with large enemies feel especially grand and dynamic in a way that they never have before in past FromSoft games. So anyway, you're exploring and then you find a cave or some catacombs or something else. What is this side content actually like? Now after the network test, there was some concern that this side stuff would be too short or simple, and quite frankly, what was shown off back in November was pretty lacking. At the time though, I felt that these were just introductions and not necessarily reflective of how they'd be for the entire game. And I was right. After the intro section, the length and complexity of these areas skyrockets, and they only continue to get markedly better the deeper you get into the game. 
Despite how many there are, there wasn't a single one where I felt like FromSoft phoned it in. Areas like catacombs, for example, get noticeably more devious and memorable, with plenty of tricks and traps and loads of secrets hidden within. Some of the best content in the game is in these side areas, and I found myself spending anywhere from 15 minutes to sometimes hours in just one of these sections. Again, it does start out pretty simple and short early on, but trust me, you'll quickly find some lengthy stuff. That brings us to the structure of Elden Ring. If I had to give a number, I'd say roughly 85 to 90% of this game is quote unquote optional. In that sense, it's kind of like Breath of the Wild in that you're exploring around at your own pace to get stronger before tackling the main stuff. And this takes many different forms. Maybe it's a dungeon, maybe it's a cave, maybe it's an overworld boss, maybe it's an abandoned village, maybe it's a castle, maybe it's a bunch of things and I should stop reading off a list. The point is, there's a lot to do and FromSoft has managed to make all of it engaging and worthwhile. And that's achieved primarily through two things. One, the raw quality of the level designs, enemy designs, and boss designs, and two, the power of secrets and surprises. One minute you might be finding your new favorite weapon, and the next minute you might stumble across an NPC questline. These sorts of surprises are spread out everywhere, and the effect that this has is that it makes you want to check every part of the map. There isn't obvious filler content like you might find in other open world games. It's that classic FromSoft quality of handcrafted design, but expanded to an absurd degree. I said this in the network test video, but instead of thinking of this game in terms of other open world games, think of it as one gigantic Dark Souls level with lots and lots of smaller Dark Souls levels scattered around throughout it. You know, the more I think about it, this game feels like two, maybe three Souls games mashed together with how much there is to do. It's incredible. What about the rest of the game? What about the areas that aren't optional? These are essentially extra big traditional Dark Souls levels with the level design fans like myself have grown to love over the years. Stormvale Castle, the first one, is roughly the size of the entirety of Boletaria from Demon's Souls, if not larger. And this size and complexity is maintained for the entire game with the rest of them. Some even get bigger. Straight up, these are the best levels FromSoft has ever created. They're so large and intricate and expertly crafted with fun encounters. There's also an impressive level of verticality in all of them, and the way they're all woven together is nothing short of a masterclass. Part of this is achieved through the new jumping mechanic. Going from rooftop to rooftop and scaling large structures has never been better. If the game was just these legacy dungeons and nothing else, it would not only still be game of the year, but I think it might also be longer than Demon's Souls. There's this attention to detail in not only every environment, but the enemies themselves. This has always been a thing in FromSoft games, but it's truly been raised to the next level here. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey man, that all sounds pretty great, open worlds are cool, attention to detail, blah blah blah, but I think I'm gonna miss having a hub area. And you know, that's fair. Not having that is a real bummer. So it's a good thing they added one. Because of course they did. This is the ultimate FromSoft game. Why wouldn't it have a hub area? I don't want to spend too much time on this due to spoilers, but just know that this area is cool and it's filled with plenty of interesting people to speak to. And let me just say, there's this passion that shines through every facet of Elden Ring. So much care and love was put into this. They didn't have to go this hard. They really didn't. On top of that, they still have the confidence to hide some of the coolest things in random corners of the map or behind fake walls. This has been a thing since Dark Souls, but it bears repeating how insane it is that they do this. What other developer in the AAA space would trust the player enough to put some of the best stuff in the game behind some random wall? I don't think there is one. That's enough about the world though, the combat is the real meat of this game, so let's talk about it. Quite simply, this is an evolution of the combat from Dark Souls 3, but it's been refined and added to so that it's better than ever. I know at a glance, a lot of it might look very similar to Dark Souls 3, but trust me, this feels so much better that it's hard to imagine going back. All of this is the result of lots of fine tuning to get the speed of the animations and the numbers involved with all these attacks just right, along with designing enemies to complement the whole system. There was a moment where I realized that I had unconsciously been using my entire moveset for each weapon I tried, even the jump attacks and even the weapon arts. If you're a longtime fan of FromSoft, you'll know how crazy that is. In past games, it's far too easy to rely solely on R1 or light attacks to get through 99% of encounters and bosses. And why wouldn't you? It's the most efficient option in those games. And FromSoft must have noticed this because they tweaked things and added new mechanics so that every part of the moveset is actually useful and feels right. The two big mechanics they added were guard counters and breaking an enemy's stance. To guard counter, you just block an attack either with a shield or while two-handing a weapon, and then you press heavy attack to do a very quick and very strong counter attack. This alone speeds up the pace of combat immensely and makes defensive playstyles much more active than they've ever been. As for stance breaking, basically every enemy and boss in the game can have its stance broken, and when that happens, you can follow up with a critical hit. The fastest ways to break an enemy's stance are heavy attacks, jump attacks, and guard counters. So boom, that's the trick to making these attacks worth it in a way that they weren't in past games. Combat just feels 
good. They nailed it this time. I kept switching weapons throughout my playthrough in a sort of disbelief, thinking maybe I just happened to choose one that felt good, but no. They all feel this good, and the effort that must have gone into that deserves to be recognized. And that's honestly just scratching the surface for the combat in this game. You also have horseback combat, which feels so natural and fluid that I was confident using my horse at every opportunity. There's also range combat and magic. For magic, there are so many fun spell options in this game, and I won't get into it here, but I will say I recommend putting at least a few points into intelligence or faith so that you can try it for yourself. My first playthroughs of FromSoft games usually involve purely melee, but this time I decided to try a bit of everything because it was just too much fun and mixed in with the melee better than ever before. And the fact that you can charge most spells for extra damage adds a surprising amount of depth that simply wasn't there in past games. Oh yeah, you can also customize the weapon arts for weapons too with Ashes of War that you find. There are so, so many of these. For example, there's now a couple dozen options for what move you want to add to your standard longsword. And on top of all of that, there's dual wheel power stancing, which means a whole extra moveset added for every weapon type in the game. In summary, the sheer amount of choice that you have when it comes to building your character and choosing your weapons and spells is larger than it's ever been, and thinking about the potential replay value that this adds is just wild. Next, I want to go over a few other new systems and mechanics that were added to the game and give some quick thoughts on them. Crafting. Yes, you can collect materials and craft now, but don't worry, if the thought of that annoys you, you can mostly ignore it. While I myself wasn't annoyed, I didn't engage with this too much outside of crafting arrows and cures for stuff like poison. Spirit summoning. Most boss fights let you summon the spirits of enemies to help you. Again, I didn't engage with this one a whole lot either, but it's a great option to have, especially if you're struggling and want a bit of extra help while playing solo still. Stakes of Merica. These are essentially checkpoints added before most boss fights that let you retry immediately after dying and I deeply appreciate them. Dying has never been less frustrating in a FromSoft game. And I'm sure some people will see this as a concession making the game less, quote, hardcore, but take it from a longtime fan to say that running two minutes back to the boss was never a highlight of those games, and you can now spend more time doing the fun stuff. In fact, I was encouraged more than ever to attempt bosses I was clearly underleveled for just because of how little friction there was with failing this time around. Lastly, stealth. You can now crouch to sneak around. This is a great addition that makes engaging enemies a bit more thoughtful. Don't expect anything crazy like stealthing an entire camp Assassin's Creed style, but it's a fun new way to engage, or potentially avoid, groups of enemies. Also, I want to briefly talk about the difficulty of this game, because I know this was discussed a lot before release, and I have some thoughts on this. Overall, I would say FromSoft nailed it. They somehow made a game that's not only fun and challenging for longtime fans like myself, but one that's simultaneously accessible for new players. How is that possible? Well, it comes down to the structure of the game itself. Because it's open world, and because you have the choice of doing 100 things at any given time, that means you can always just leave if you're struggling and come back later when you're stronger. If you're more experienced like myself, you might not need to do this too often, but if you're new, this is a valid option and one that the game seems to welcome. And for the record, even I myself had to leave areas occasionally. There were several times where I found a boss I was massively underleveled for and just couldn't do it. So I marked my map and came back later. This is a double-edged sword though. You can unintentionally trivialize content by discovering it when you're overleveled or overgeared. From that perspective, this game has the potential to be easier than past FromSoft games for experienced fans. This happened to me a few times, but I think it's just an unavoidable result of the game's open structure. They could have scaled certain areas and enemies to some extent, but I think that would have been the wrong call, as that almost never feels good. I'm looking at you, Elder Scrolls. Whenever I noticed that I was overleveled, I made the conscious choice to equip a lower level weapon and use it as an opportunity to experiment with different playstyles. Ultimately, it's up to you though, because there still is a lot of joy in steamrolling enemies, as it reflects how much your character has grown. I want to be real clear though, this is still a hard game, and I lost count of how many times I died, especially in the dungeons. So don't take all of this as me saying the game is easy, because it's not. The movesets and designs of the enemies and bosses are seriously the best they've ever been, and you'll regularly be pushed to your limit. I know there are people who watch my stuff and have never touched a FromSoft game, and I know this because they'll say so in the comments. If you're one of those people, I'm now speaking directly to you. First of all, regardless of your mechanical gaming abilities, I promise you can beat these games. And that's never been more true than here in Elden Ring. I know the reputation that these games have, and I know some people are scared off because of it, but you can do this. If you're struggling, you can just leave and come back later, experiment with different playstyles, or summon someone to help you online. These games are not Kaizo Mario levels of difficulty, not by a long shot. If you're patient and willing to learn, I guarantee you'll beat this game. Next, I don't usually talk about game performance in my videos, and I'm not sure where to fit this in, but I do want to make a quick mention that the PC version currently has some slight frame stuttering at times. 
typically just in the overworld. My guess is that it's some sort of issue with loading things in. I talked with a few other people to confirm it wasn't just me. This is by no means game breaking, and as a whole, the game still ran perfectly for me 90 to 95% of the time. There is apparently going to be a day one patch that will hopefully address this, but this is unfortunately a thing, and it's worth knowing if you're getting this game on PC. Now, if you've really taken to heart everything I've said, I'm just going to assume you're going to play this game for yourself, so I have a few suggestions to help you have the most fun with this game. First, I know a lot of people are looking forward to playing through the entire game with a friend, and while you can do that, I'd advise not exploring the open world sections too much with a friend. The reason for this is that it's just too big. There are certainly sections that are suited for co-op, but I think a lot of this game is very much designed with your horse in mind, and since that's disabled for co-op, you're probably better off doing that part alone. By all means though, if you come across an overworld boss, invite a friend for that, and it goes without saying that the side stuff like caves and catacombs along with the legacy dungeons are perfectly suited for co-op with a friend. My next piece of advice is take your time. This game is dense, and it's incredibly easy to miss huge areas of side content. With Limgrave especially, the starting zone, really take your time. Not only will you find lots of important gear and upgrades, but you'll also find NPC quest lines that continue throughout the rest of the game. Also, it's going to be disappointing if you come back to explore Limgrave 40 hours in and you're two-shotting the bosses. So take your time, this game will reward you for it. My last piece of advice is experiment with different playstyles. This game dumps loads of upgrade materials on you, and there's an option to respec multiple times later on. So don't stress too hard about committing to one thing or min-maxing your build. If you find something cool, just put enough stats in to try it out and have fun messing around. And yeah, I think that's enough to get you started. At the end of my Elden Ring network test video, I closed it by saying it's not often that a high-profile game lives up to the hype. And now, after spending the last week playing it non-stop, I can safely say that, for me at least, it has. This is a game people will be talking about for years, and it's one that I think everyone needs to experience for themselves. Thanks for watching, and good luck in Elden Ring.